So hi, everyone. Um, and I would just like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of this land before we begin um, of where I am joining you today and when, where you are all joining us. I am joining you from the Gadigal um, lands of the Aura Nation. And if you all wanna um, enter in the uh, chat where you're joining us from today. Um, and so thank you very much for joining and I'm really excited to see so many of you here. Um, and so this is the first of a series of a lunchtime seminars uh, aimed uh, for early and mid-career researchers all interested um, in citizen science or conducting citizen science projects already. This uh, emerged uh, after the conference that we had earlier this year or later last year um, when we had a session that was aimed at research in citizen science and we really saw that there was um, an increased interest and need uh, into discussing this a little bit um, further and creating a community around these topics. And so the aim of these lunch seminars um, are really to just bring all of us researchers and other people interested in citizen science uh, research together to form a community and to start to having these discussions um, about citizen science research here in Australia. And we have a lot of great opportunities for research. We also have some challenges um, that we're all uh, facing. And so bringing us together and having a conversation about hopefully we can try and work together on some of these challenges. Um, so the way that we structure these seminars is to be once a month. Um, in order for it to be easy for everyone to remember, it will be the first Thursday of every month. We have an hour and a half scheduled, but we might not need the whole hour and a half uh, for these sessions. We'll just see how we go. Um, so if you can go on and save these, this date in your calendar for the next, for the dates for the rest of 2021, that would be great. And the structure um, of these seminars is first of all, a little bit of an introduction, what we're going to discuss. Uh, each session will, will have a different topic. Um, then we'll have a presentation given by one of us, uh, a short Q&A. Um, and after that, we wanna highlight one of the issues that's been discussed in the presentation, uh, some of the challenges or um, things that people have been uh, um, working with really, um, and open that to a conversation for the whole community to think how we can work collaboratively uh, to solve some of these issues or to just work together to promote uh, these topics. Um, and that, that's basically the structure uh, of these seminars. Um, and we hope it will be a place for us to really um, come together as a community. Um, so I do wanna um, just see who the people that are here or just for all of us to know who all these people that are joining are. So I'm gonna launch a poll, just asking you some really basic questions about who you are and what your interests are. Um, and if you could um, just answer that so we could all you know, see who our growing community is. Okay, so I think we have most of the people who have already completed the poll. So I'm gonna close this now um, so we can just see um, who the people who are joining us today are. Okay, so we have uh, quite a few people from uh, NSW, Victoria, South Australia, um, a few from uh, ACT and oh, two from outside Australia. Okay, that's very cool. And so this uh, was aimed at early and mid-career researchers, um, but I see we also have quite a few people from government and people that are other. So unfortunately I couldn't have like an open text in these polls, so I'm, I'm quite curious to see who those others are, but maybe we can uh, open that later when we have the conversation, people can tell us exactly what they're doing and what their interests are. Um, and involvement in citizen science, we have quite a few project leaders and coordinators um, and other people doing um, research using citizen science data and just interested in citizen science. So I think that's great. And I think this is exactly what we were hoping to have sort of a broad community from different places with lots of different interests. So I'm really happy um, to see this and it's great to know who's joining us today. Um, so 
Um, just the last thing that I'm going to um, discuss is um, these seminars. So uh, we have our first speaker today that I'm going to introduce shortly, which is uh, uh, Pat Bonnie. Uh, but we're going to welcome people from within the community to give these um, presentations and to give these talks. And I will discuss exactly the system of how we're going to do that later in this in the, in the wrap up of the of the seminar. But I just want all of you to think while you're hearing this presentation, if you have something to share with us as a community, and particularly if you're keen on discussing some of the challenges you might have had while doing your work, while um, engaging in research, and something that you think that would be beneficial for our community to discuss uh, together. And so with that, I am going to um, introduce our first speaker today. Dr. Pat Bonney, who is actually also the co-host of these uh, lunch seminar sessions. And I had a paper with the things I was supposed to introduce you, Pat, but I don't have it in front of me now. So you can, I'll just let you introduce yourself, but Pat is going to discuss um, uh, his PhD work and his um, work now on freshwater citizen science. So take it away. Thanks, Yella. I'll just get you to, to stop sharing and I can share my screen. Can I get a thumbs up to see if people can see that, Gayla? Yeah, all good. Okay, well, thanks you, thanks Gayla, and and hi everyone. It is really great to see um, so many of you here from from different parts of Australia and in different roles. Um, and welcome to the first of what I hope is is many uh, seminars discussing developments in in citizen science research in Australia. Um, my name is Pat Bonney. I'm a, I'm a social researcher at Federation University in Victoria. Uh, I've been involved in citizen science for the past four or so years, um, beginning with my PhD in 2016, and also through various other projects in freshwater and marine environments. Um, in this presentation, uh, I want to provide some a bit of a tour of freshwater citizen science um, across the country, some current projects that I've been involved in and have been researching, but also some perspectives on what the future might hold for the practice. Before I continue, I, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land that I've conducted this research um, and am presenting on you today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the Gunnawal people of ACT region and the Gunai Kurnai people of East Gippsland. Uh, I want to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and for their continued custodianship of the land and waters um, across these areas in Australia. And this photo is from Gunai Kurnai country. Uh, it's no more than 100 metres from where I am sitting right now. It's a place called Boggy Creek, located at the tip of uh, Lake Tyres in East Gippsland. And it's where the fresh water meets the salty water of Lake Tyres. And I think this is a nice metaphor to capture what I'm interested in when it comes to citizen science. And that is, you know, how projects help to facilitate meaningful and lasting connections between community and the wider environmental governance landscape. But I'm from Brunswick uh, and in a past life, I was a freshwater scientist at the University of Melbourne and did a lot of work across Victoria studying the effects of pollution, um, including Mary Creek, which some of you may be aware of in the north. And these photos show that over time, over the last four decades or so, Mary Creek has undergone a pretty significant transformation. And, it's, and these improvements have largely been the result of the passion and dedication of volunteers um, and also partnerships between, the, with, between government and the Mary Creek Management Committee, which is a, a community-based environmental organisation. And so it was this awareness that um, volunteers and that these organisations can have on the, on the local environments that definitely did inspire my transition from freshwater science to studying um, the role and influence of community-based environmental management, including citizen science. So today I'd like to discuss some of the problems that are affecting freshwater environments in Australia to sort of frame this presentation. Um, also, uh, I'll be describing a diversity of approaches to freshwater citizen science, beginning with WaterWatch, which formed the basis of my PhD. Uh, next is the National Waterbug Blitz, which was a project funded in the first round of the, citizen, federal, the federal government citizen science grants. And then finally, Living Bungyanda, which is a, a community-led and place-based citizen science project uh, and is why I'm over in East Gippsland at the moment. 
Uh, I want to end with what I've called some provocation just intended to stimulate some discussion and some reflection. Um, they might be relevant to you, they might be not, but um, you know, I just wanted to, those provocations um, that are drawn from insights uh, that uh, I've, I've held from, um, that I've got from doing my work in citizen science over the past four years. So over the last 200 years and, and since settlement, uh, many of Australia's rivers, lakes, estuaries, wetlands uh, have been heavily degraded and are currently in a pretty perilous state. River flows are decreasing, groundwater levels too. Um, there's a loss of and degradation of habitat. Birds, mammals and fish, they're also, um, their populations are shrinking. And, and all these changes have flow and effects that you know, will affect local communities, but also the capacity of these systems, these, the social systems, the environmental systems to recover from future environmental changes, much like we saw um, in the bushfires last year. And nowhere is this more evident than in the Murray-Darling Basin, which accounts for 14% of Australia's total uh, land mass and whose freshwater resources support more than 30% of our total food production. And you may have heard or read the recent publication um, in Global Change Biology by a group of Australian scientists that described 19 collapsing ecosystems and uh, the Murray-Darling Basin was, was one of those. And in our urban environments, the situation is, is just as dire, but affected by different sets of issues, um, particularly pollution. Um, and this is an example from 2018 on the left where a fire ripped through a warehouse in Melbourne's inner, inner west and it discharged some pretty toxic uh, pollutants into a creek called Stony Creek. Residents of the area, include um, friends of Stony Creek, describe this as being ecologically dreadful and basically exterminating everything. And just a year later, red pollutant um, you know, entered the creek from a stormwater drain and further to both the environment and um, the local community. So I think we'd all agree that citizen science can be part of the solution in addressing some of these challenges in freshwater environments. But to do this, it, I think it requires a better understanding of how uh, members of the public, community groups, scientists, government agencies can all work together to bring these projects to life um, to achieve this really complex goal. And so this motivates much of my research into citizen science to date. But as we all know, um, there's many ways to do citizen science and each have their own different goals. They operate at different scales. They're underpinned by different values, theories and, and concepts. Um, I've chosen three projects to uh, discuss today, which, is, uh, which, uh, which are projects that I've been involved in. Um, and uh, they have neatly grouped into a typology from a, from a great paper um, by Eitzel and colleagues and also co-authored by one of AXA's own, uh, Jesse Oliver. And this, high, this typology highlighted citizen science as a way to build community capacity as a tool to advance science or as a movement to de democratize science. Um, if you are interested though, uh, in a more broad review of freshwater citizen science in Australia, uh, I recently published this, this paper from, in the Australasian Journal of Environmental Management, which was drawn from a survey of, of program coordinators of, of known citizen science projects. All right. Um, yeah, so Waterwatch, uh, beginning in 1993, uh, initially it was about raising awareness of environmental problems, but over time there's been an increasing emphasis on greater use of the information collected for environmental management and policy. And some key developments that have taken place over the past 30 years have really been about improving um, the data that's been coming out of the programs, having rigorous quality assurance and quality control procedures there's been a technology that's, that was been uh, developed over time. Uh, this, this, the Victorian Waterwatch portal was developed in 2015, um, and that's sort of improving uh, data access and management. There was, <laughs> I just found this the other day. There's also a board game that was released in the mid '90s, but I haven't managed to come across that. So, um, as part of my PhD, I wanted to sort of understand a little bit about the participation rates, and so these figures are drawn from all the data records from both the Victorian Water Watch program and the Upper Murrumbidgee program. And you can see uh, that the, the, the chart shows the, the, um, the change over time in the number of records that are being submitted, but also the number of new, unique sites that are being um, monitored over time. Uh, in Victoria, Water Watch reached a peak in uh, the end of the millennium drought in around 2010. 
but has gradually been declining since then, uh, largely due to some regional governments um, withdrawing their support for water watch programs. And the ACT, the situation is a little bit different with some stepwise increases in participation. Currently, uh, the latest data, data I've got there is 2017, so a, bit, a little bit old, but um, you, the number of sites is around 230, 40, and uh, the number of records that are coming in each year is around 1,500, which is quite uh, impressive. Uh, data uptake has been a really important goal, as I mentioned, um, and it's important not only for justifying the program's value for funders, but also for volunteers who I've found um, I feel really valued when, when their efforts work towards something, even if they're not the beneficiaries of those data. Um, but there hadn't been any reviews on how citizen science data was being used to inform freshwater management and policy. And so that uh, was something that I wanted to achieve in my PhD. And so I documented as many instances of data uptake as possible. Um, and this figure shows just a small selection of these impacts. Um, it also shows that data uptake can occur across different geographic scales and at different points in the, um, the management and policy cycle. But despite some successful instances, one of the most enduring challenges for Water Watch has been dealing with negative perceptions that citizen science is not a credible, relevant or legitimate source of environmental information. And this quote here about great skepticism and overt opposition is um, from a paper published in 1999 um, and unfortunately, those perspectives do still exist. And so despite WaterWatch improving its data quality uh, protocols and uh, collecting data that has been shown to be comparable to professional approaches, I really wanted to get to the bottom of what is stopping citizen science data being more readily used in government decision making. And what I found after speaking with many scientists, volunteers, coordinators, policymakers, is that the barriers to data uptake are more complex than issues of data and data quality and include social and organizational factors as well. And you know, knowledge sharing uh, is a social process. And so it makes sense that the barriers to uptake have um, these associated social dimensions. Uh, for those interested from a theoretical perspective, uh, this is from a chapter in my PhD um, where I use the concept of boundary work to describe how scientists and decision makers have historically excluded Water Watch from their work, or just use language that casts Water Watch in a more sort of uh, in a less favourable light. Um, so the on the left here we've got uh, these elements of boundary work that sort of construct boundaries between Water Watch and expert communities through exclusion or constructing differences. Exclusion being you know uh, Water Watch not being considered to be accurate data and just sidelined. Um, constructing differences being like, well, the things that we want to monitor, the community can't monitor, so we're different to them. But boundary work is also useful to describe how we can overcome some of these differences and these divisions. And I found that um, when there were successful instances of data uptake, there was some, some key reasons or key factors that helped that happen. The first one was boundary spanners. Those, these people are, these, these people are, are you know, are those that sit between the expert communities and uh, uh, the Water Watch program who help to facilitate the, the uptake of information. And so boundary spanners were found to be a really important person to be um, a bit of a champion for the, the Water Watch program. Boundary objects and the boundary objects are or databases that have or dual functions in that they are relevant to both government decision makers but also for community so they bridge that divide as well and so this quote here says um, on the one hand uh, my connection is is fine Ella I'm just getting a notification that's all yep I can hear you fine okay thanks so this quote here about boundary objects or the report is that on the one hand it gives a um, catchment picture for catchment managers but on the other hand it's a really important summary tool for volunteers who they then can look at their individual sites um, and then the other thing that was was helpful in affecting the uptake of citizen science data and decision making was the creation of temporary spaces the creation of temporary projects um, this quote here from a coordinator uh, for one of my case studies uh, suggested that by getting involved in some of these short-term projects, um, they were able to shift the perspective. So break down some of those boundaries that Water Watch is low quality data and therefore doesn't have much use. 
And then just a final quote, um, just to, uh, to, to cast this in a more positive light is that I think the, the acceptance of water watch data is improving. And this quote here from a government scientist saying that they think that it's changing, but it's just time. But um, for time and at a time, it's a, a changing of the guards. So moving on to the second project is the National Water Bug Blitz, which was, was funded by the first round of the federal government citizen science grant initiative. The aim of the project was to encourage volunteers and community groups to identify water bugs and um, collect them and contribute to a national database for use by scientists and decision makers. Um, in doing so, we developed an app that was uh, was led by Australia's, one of Australia's water bug gurus, John Gooderham, um, which takes a really difficult process of macro invertebrate identification and sort of uh, makes it relatively simple for volunteers to record and identify what's lurking around in um, Australia's rivers. And so we ran around 50 training workshops across Australia and had some great turnouts to these events. Um, and outside of these training events, the uptake of the, uh, the app was was good, but it was probably less than we hoped for, but we still managed to uh, monitor around 300 new sites, not previously monitored by government agencies. One of the things that was surprising about this project was some of these, what, what I'm calling un unanticipated effects. Um, we, through our partnerships and through our interactions with different government agencies, we were, we were able to collate water, monitor, uh, water bug data that hadn't been um, available for, uh, for um, for use um, before. And so we collated information from different government agencies around, around Australia into a single database. And uh, this is something, as I said, we didn't initially expect. And it shows that citizen science projects may have impacts that aren't envisaged at the outset of, of, um, of its development. So that's the main point that I wanted to make about the, the National Water Bug Blitz. And the final project is Living Bunyanda, which is a project I'm running with a, um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Jessica Reeves uh, from Federation University. And it's located in Lake Tyres in East Gippsland. Um, the idea for this project began with, with conversations and um, relationships with the local community, the Gunai Kurnai Aboriginal Corporation and the Lake Tyres Aboriginal Trust. All of these groups wanted to know more about the environmental condition of Lake Tyres. Um, but they, they didn't feel like their concerns were being heard uh, by government agencies. So we worked with them to co-create a citizen science program um, and that involves more than just monitoring water quality, but it's also about monitoring birds and fish, uh, uh, the impacts of deer and also vegetation. Um, it can be observational data uploaded to iNaturalist or we can do uh, systematic monitoring, um, much like the Water Watch uh, type approach. And so Living Banyanda is, is more than just a citizen science program, though. It's also about valuing other ways of knowing and understanding environmental change, uh, such as through art and local knowledge, because everyone we speak to here has a different way in which they connect with their environment and understand environmental change. So we wanted to be as open as possible and to incorporate some of that, those different perspectives and those different knowledges. And one of the things that I really loved about my role in Living Banyanda is, is how it's how my role has unexpectedly changed from researcher to facilitator. And this has um, involved a whole, learning a whole new set of skills, um, which I'm still learning. And, but I'm still, I'm still conducting research and talking to many participants in the program and the wider community to understand sort of the historical context of the area and also their can, needs and concerns. Um, but I'm also interested in how these types of projects offer more equitable and effective ways to engage local communities so that they can understand, um, better understand and protect uh, places that they care deeply about. Um, and overall, I think Living Banyanda is, is, a, is a welcome alternative to the increasing dominance of this top-down scientist-led citizen science projects that we're, we're seeing um, uh, in Australia at the moment uh, and across the world. I think place-based and community-led citizen science is going to be critical if we are to address um, the challenges, uh, the social and ecological challenges that we're facing. And this is primarily because uh, projects can be developed that, that when they are relevant to the needs of local communities, um, who are often the ones that are affected, by most, affected most by environmental change. So what I thought I'd do just quickly um, is highlight some examples of what I mean by incorporating uh, local knowledge and art. And so we, I enlisted the help of a photographer to capture 
um, the people and places of Lake Tyres. Uh, this project was about celebrating the lived experiences of people and their different ways of knowing place. And first was Jack. He's a, a, long, a long-standing advocate of environmental issues in Lake Tyres. He started the Lake Tyres Coast Action Group in the early 1990s. And over time and with, with much trust and patience, we've been recording his stories and his incredible knowledge of the area. Um, one of the key issues in Lake Tyres is the opening and closing of the sandbar where the lake meets the sea. And Jack has documented every known opening and closing of that estuary since 1886. And so clearly this is a, a really valuable resource, not only for science, but for wider community education and engagement. Next is Josie, um, who is an artist and has been living in Lake Tyres her entire life. Her artwork uh, strongly reflects issues around environmental change. Um, these canvas here, she places in Lake Tyres in different locations and allows to degrade over a 12 month period and then embroids them with patterns of the uh, top of, embroids them with topographical maps of the area and the different time, the moon cycles as well. And so we wanted to capture this different way of un understanding environmental change and to create a more uh, holistic understanding of uh, the issues that people are facing and different ways of connecting to the environment. And then finally is Frank. Uh, he's in the blue shirt here. He's a retired teacher um, and he has an unmatched knowledge for the, um, the an unmatched botanical knowledge of the vegetation across uh, Lake Tyres. He's also a photographer and has been recently documenting the recovery of bushfire affected areas across the Lake Tyres catchment. And so we're currently working with Frank to digitize some of his observations and to learn from his uh, also his incredible knowledge of the area as well, particularly when it comes to uh, the vegetation and uh, threatened species. So the challenge for me over and, and for, for Jess over the next year is to continue to document the impacts of this project uh, in the hope that it can stimulate similar types of community led and place based projects that are directly aligned, as I said, with community needs, uh, values and, and concerns. Uh, and so if you do know of any similar projects, I'd, I'd really like to have a chat with you and, and, and learn more about that. So as a, as a summary, uh, freshwater citizen science in Australia is long standing, um, nearly uh, around about 30 or three decades old now. Um, it's also expanding and diversifying, uh, not, it's, 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 gone, it's going beyond government and it's being uh, supported through universities, but also through um, more community-based organisations like uh, the Living Bumyanda project. It's impacting policy. I think this is an important outcome um, uh, for citizen, the citizen science world is, is wanting to see that citizen science data can uh, impact environmental policy and environmental uh, management. Importantly, I think uh, citizen science is more than just science. Uh, I think it is a precursor to community empowerment. Um, and then finally, citizen science, uh, from my perspective, is about valuing the relations between people and place. So as I said, I'd, I thought I'd end with some provocations for discussion and reflection. Um, for citizen science research here in Australia. Uh, the first one here is uh, meaningful and lasting citizen science hinges as much on the quality of relationships built as it does on the science produced. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, place-based and community-led citizen science is gonna be critical if we're addressing the, the challenges that freshwater environments ha uh, are facing. And in these cases, researchers will become facilitators. And then three, uh, science is only one way of understanding environmental change, local knowledge and environmental narratives can enrich citizen science. So just a few acknowledgements there. Uh, most importantly, I wanna thank all uh, participants that have uh, you know, yeah, participated in my research, uh, particularly the volunteers, community groups and, and traditional owners, um, as well as for their you know, passion and dedication for protecting Australia's waterways. So thank you very much. And thank you AXA for, for um, having me here today.